As we move forward in rebuilding this country, one must express serious disappointment at some individuals who continue to plunder state resources for personal benefit. We have seen these individuals divert national funds intended for important projects for their own benefit. We can no longer allow these people to place their personal interest above that of the country. In 2011, Swaziland, famed guardian of African tradition, was forced to ask neighboring South Africa for a bailout. People were hungry. 63% of the population were living below the poverty line. Yet the king of Swaziland, Mswati III, was and still is one of the richest leaders in Africa. His personal fortune in 2011 was estimated at 100 million US dollars and he was sole trustee of an estimated 10 billion US dollar royal fund. While the king, Africa's last absolute monarch, is revered by his people, these gross inequalities are the result of a political system in crisis. For the last 40 years, a state of emergency has been used and political parties have been banned from functioning. We have been born out of a society that encourages you not to challenge, not to question, keep quiet, don't be problematic. Then you will survive. By the 1890s, Swazi royalty had granted land and mining concessions to white settlers. The settlers obtained large portions of the country. And in 1903, Swaziland became a British protectorate. Anxious about the growing settler ownership of land, Swazi royalty set up the Lifa Fund. All Swazi working people were asked to contribute a portion of their wages to buy back the land. Most of the little land that was bought was controlled by the king. Britain made few changes to traditional rule and in 1921, Sopuza II succeeded as Ingwenyama, or leader of the Swazi people. He was advised by the Queen Mother and the Likoko, a council of elders largely composed of members of the royal family. By the 1940s, the British had taken so much land that only one-third was left for the Swazi people. Industry grew and in towns and workplaces, political parties and trade unions developed to represent people's views. Sopuza saw them as unswazi, divisive elements brought by imperialists. <laughs> The trade unions organized worker strikes against low pay. The conditions of the cane cutters was terrible. The conditions in the mines were terrible in terms of what their remuneration, in terms of the environment, in terms of safety. Uh, they were appalling. That was a one trigger that brought the unions into uniting with all forces that wanted change uh, from the colonial regime. Many saw the king's insistence on tradition as stifling. By the early 60s, there was a clear resistance to Sobuza's authoritarian style, which he claimed was traditional, as well as to British rule. In the 1960s, you have a wave of uh, liberation movements in Africa. So Swaziland is not going to be left behind. The modern people, educated people then come into the picture. They start by forming associations, but then eventually the associations are graduating into political movements. Dr. Ambrose Zwani, leader of the Ngwani National Liberatory Congress, or NNLC, 
spoke of the sudden awakening of a dispossessed people, fully determined to rise to nationhood of equality with other independent and democratic countries of the world. That party was instrumental towards uh, the gain of independence, uh, which was negotiated with the uh, British government. A number of delegations had gone to the UK to discuss uh, about the handover of independence to Swaziland. Under pressure from trade unions and political parties, Britain agreed to grant Swaziland independence as a multi-party democracy. King Sobuza unwillingly established his own political party. The British told him they were not going to hand over the country to an individual, not in the 20th century. So he was coerced to form what was then called Imbowoto National Movement. The first Swazi elections respected the democracy enshrined in the constitution. The Imbowoto National Movement was able to win all the votes. And Zwane's uh, party did not feature much uh, even in the constitutional discussions, for instance, the last constitutional discussions that took place in London, he was uh, excluded. We know this is documented in history where he went, I don't know where he got the money from, but he went to London and tried to block those discussions. He wanted to enter into the conference room, but they, they, they refused him, and then he, he went, was trying to block that, and he was removed by force by the police. He was trying to protest that his exclusion was not uh, legitimate. The new constitution granted Sobuza Swaziland's considerable mineral rights. He set up Tibio Takangwani, a trust fund where income from mineral rights was saved for the Swazi nation. Tibio was supposed to assist the material welfare, standards of living and education of the people. But Tibio paid no taxes and was totally controlled by the king. In the same year, King Sobuza had a new son, Makoseti Vedlamini. His mother, Mfombit Fala, looked after him in the royal compound. In 1972, Sobuza's INM party won 